Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous Patreons, my British Rail Critics, and my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward and Lord Captain Von Thrust III. You were the reason why this content remains present. Like it's here. In the present. Right now. Hooray! And today, we have a bit of an unexpected turn of events. One of my more one-off top five videos actually did surprisingly well. And many of you offered me suggestions as to how I could continue it as its own series. So I figured, hey, since I'm getting a bunch of support for it, why not? Today we have five more amazing trains that never stood a chance. The SWBLW, or the Beep is actually a single example of a rebuild of a VO-1000 constructed by Baldwin, which was one of that company's only successful diesel lines. As you can see, it's a switcher, and I love American switchers. I mean, I am an American, but I really like our switchers. They're so adorable, like all of them, with those little long noses and the single cabs at the end. I've always liked how they look. And just so we're clear, I'm gonna keep calling it a switcher, but for context, my UK audience, you would call this a shunter. Understand that those terms actually mean the same thing, it's just a regional terminology thing. Here we call them switchers, but they're the same as shunters. I've actually had some people from the UK try to correct me on this, and it's not a wrong statement, it's just a regional thing. Now what's the deal with the beep? Why was there only one? Well, like I said, it was rebuilt from a VO-1000, and the reason was that Santa Fe was looking to upgrade their aging fleet of the Baldwin switchers. They'd already had some success rebuilding their CF-7s in an effort to modernize them, and the thought was, rebuilding should, in theory, be a lot cheaper than purchasing new rolling stock outright. The plan for the beep, which was Santa Fe number 1460, it actually had several numbers, that's the one it still has, so we're gonna go with that, was to replace some of its old Baldwin components with new EMD prime movers. And the results, in terms of performance, were favorable. The beep gained significant power output and tractive effort as a result. It was reliable, and the crews loved it as it had superior riding quality. The problem was cost. As it turned out, the rebuild wound up being more expensive than just purchasing new rolling stock outright. It wasn't economically viable, which is a shame because the locomotive was quite good. As a result, 1460 was the only example of this particular rebuild ever manufactured. And it wound up staying in service for quite a long time. It was originally built in 1943, and the rebuilt was finished in 1970. It wasn't retired until 2008, and fortunately, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It was retired, yes, but instead of being scrapped, they opted to donate it to the Western American Railroad Museum in Barstow, California, where it is now sitting on static display. So while she may never have gotten any siblings, she did prove that you could stick EMD components in a Baldwin chassis and make a really good locomotive. So I guess there's that. The British Rail HS4000 Kestrel. You know what? No. Not doing it. Not doing it today. I don't want to. This is a prototype locomotive that was built in 1967 by Brush Traction, and it was meant as a technology demonstrator to pique interest in the new diesel technology that Brush was working on. British Rail put it into service, even though it showed up quite a bit overweight. It was fitted with a Solzer 16 LVA24 engine rated at 4,000 horsepower, which meant this locomotive could go at least 110 miles per hour. Sleek, fast, and actually quite nice looking. The Castrol was impressive. While initially restricted mostly to heavy freight service due to it being overweight, it actually proved remarkably good at this, and later it was fitted with new bogies to bring the weight down, and it was used on express passenger trains. So why didn't we see more? Why wasn't there a whole class like this? Well, that largely seems to be unknown. It's unclear why British Rail didn't order it, but if I had to guess, I would say that this locomotive came in just about the tail end of their modernization plan, where they spent a ton of money on a whole bunch of diesels. British Rail actually got in trouble with the government because they were accused of overspending with little to show for it. And to be fair, that was arguably kind of true. So no matter how good the Kestrel appears to have been, British Rail wasn't in a position to invest money in something that, while it could have been good, may not have been. Behind the scenes, they were also starting work on the APT and the HST, 
and the Kestrel, while amazing in its own right, was a lot closer to the other classes British Rail was still using at the time, as a road locomotive was not purchased by British Rail, nor were any orders for anything similar put in. What did happen was the locomotive was sold to, of all people, the Soviet Union. Yeah, the UK sold it to the Soviet Union in the middle of the Cold War. I was shocked too. The Kestrel's use behind the Iron Curtain is a little bit of a mystery. What we know is that it would have been re-gauged to 1,520 millimeters, and it's believed it was used a little bit on the Russian rail network, but in the end, the engine was actually removed for static testing, and the body was ballasted for use in high load tests of other vehicles. And it's believed that the entire thing was scrapped in 1993, which is a real shame. The EMD RS1325. That name is a mouthful, so I'm going to just call them the RS. Constructed as light road switchers by EMD in 1960, the RSs were actually pretty impressive pieces of work for their era. Their cabs were high, and the long hoods were low, making it much easier for the driver to use the locomotive effectively going forward or backwards. They were considered very reliable and really effective for their jobs. So, the real question is, why did they only ever build two of them? Well, to begin with, they only ever got an order for two of them from the Chicago and Illinois Midland Railway, and those locomotives were numbered 30 and 31. So good are these locomotives that number 30 is actually still in service. It was transferred in 2016 to the Atlantic and Western Railway. Number 31 was acquired by the Monticello Railway Museum. We were working on restoring it, but I still haven't established. Why were there only two of these things? Well, that seems to be down to bad timing. EMD was proven, yeah, but the 1960s were really rough for American railways. Cars had become incredibly popular, and air travel was becoming affordable. As a result, the railways in America were sandwiched in between two other industries, and many that had established themselves over the previous century, like the Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central, were hemorrhaging money like crazy. They just didn't have the spare funds to invest in more switchers when they already had plenty of those kicking around. And despite some of those being about 20 years old by this point, they were still able to do the job just fine. So there was no reason for most of the railways to invest in new ones when they were already struggling to make ends meet as it was. It's a shame, but at least the two that were manufactured managed to last this long. The Ingalls 4S. Okay, that's a funny looking locomotive. What the heck is that? And in fact, what the heck is Ingalls? Well, Ingalls is a shipbuilding firm based in Pascagoula, Mississippi. At the end of World War II, Ingalls wanted to try their hand at locomotive manufacturing and planned a line of several diesel electric locomotives, although the only one that was ever completed was the 4S. The 4S was actually very advanced. Despite loosely resembling an American car body diesel of that era, you've probably noticed some obvious differences. The big one being that turret cab arrangement. The cab of the locomotive is set higher so that the crew is able to see both forward and backwards. One of the big problems with car body diesels of that time, and even now, frankly, is that it's hard for them to run backwards and it's more difficult for the crews to see. But with the turret cab, despite looking maybe a little odd to some people, the crew was able to see pretty well in both directions. It was given a powerful and very reliable prime mover in the form of an inline 8 65LX8, which was based on a marine diesel engine built by superior engines and compressors. The 4S could produce up to 1,650 horsepower. I may not sound like too much nowadays, but back then, that was pretty good. They were also equipped with connections for multiple unit operation, which was still a bit of a new thing back then. The 4S wound up being tested by various railroads, and even though it did incredibly well, no orders materialized. The theory is that after World War II, railways were a little hesitant to trust, well, someone who was untested when it came to locomotive manufacturing. Ingalls had never done it before, when compared to the more reliable and known EMD, or even Baldwin and Alco, who were just starting to push out diesel electrics. Ingalls was unknown, so it was hard to trust them, even though the 4S seemed really good. No orders materialized for it, or for any of the other proposed locomotives that Ingalls wanted to make. As a result, they abandoned their plans for locomotive manufacturing entirely, and the 4S was sold for the Gulf, Mobile, and Ohio Railroad, where it was numbered 1900. But the 4S was well liked by the railroad, and among their employees, it gained a reputation for being incredibly tough. It actually derailed once and landed upside down, 
but it was repaired and returned to service almost immediately. And usually, if they were gonna fix something like that, they would take a lot longer, and the 4S just took it. Like a champ. However, in 1966, the railroad actually traded it to EMD as partial payment for 22 new SD40s. EMD didn't really have a use for the 4S, so they decided to offer it to the Illinois Railway Museum for $3,000. But unfortunately, the museum actually couldn't raise the funds, and since no one else wanted it, they finally sold it off for scrap in 1967. Which is a shame because I really would have loved to see something like this get preserved. It's a one-of-a-kind locomotive, and I think it would have been really cool to see what other things Ingalls could cook up if the railways had given the 4S a shot. Sadly, it just wasn't gonna happen. The New York Central Niagara. Oh, the Niagara. I've gotten so many requests for the Niagara, and I get it. Believe me, believe me, I get it. The Niagaras were a group of 484 Northern-type steam locomotives that were named after Niagara Falls! Only 27 were ever manufactured, and they were built between 1945 and 1946. They are very distinctive on the basis that they were capable of both high speeds and significant power output. Some rail fans even think the Niagaras may have been the best steam locomotives ever made anywhere, period. But that's a little debatable. But what isn't debatable is that they were outstanding, ambitious, advanced, and phenomenal locomotives. But the real question is, why didn't they last? Well, for the same reason every other steam locomotive didn't last in America. Diesels. The Niagara was one of several locomotives put up for steam versus diesel trial runs, and the results of which were actually absurdly close. So close that the salesmen for the diesels were actually very worried about the Niagaras, but a combination of factors beyond their control would seal the Niagara's fate in the end. There were a series of coal miners' strikes, and the sales teams for dieselization were aggressive, able to shill out diesels to every single railroad around. So despite the fact that the Niagara's had shown that steam could, in fact, compete with diesel power, it just didn't matter. And in this case, the end was remarkably sad, as not a single Niagara survived in the preservation. They were all scrapped by 1956, and the reason why was actually due to the mentality of the then New York Central President Alfred E. Perlman, who really hated the idea of preservation for whatever reason, and was also the one who directly ordered that every single New York Central Hudson was scrapped. The Niagara's legacy was gone before it was written, and it really is a cry and shame. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell. <laughs>